It all seems so familiar to us these days, doesn't it? We're all familiar with the concept of evolution and natural selection, survival of the fittest. But at the time that Darwin came up with the idea, it was quite revolutionary. What, what was it that set him on the path of, of thinking about these things and coming up with these ideas? Darwin, as a very young man, uh, was, was um, destined for the church, actually. He was going to become a, a, a parson. He'd failed to become a doctor. His father wanted him to become a doctor, and having failed on that because he couldn't stand the sight of blood, um, his father thought, well, there's only one thing he can do. He'd got to go into the church. So he was sent to Cambridge to study theology. And then, most fortunately, he received an opportunity to go on HMS Beagle, which was a survey ship, uh, which was going to survey mostly the coast of South America, but that ended up going all the way around the world. And the captain, uh, Captain Fitzroy, wanted a gentleman companion to stop him from going mad. His predecessor on the Beagle had gone mad uh, and had killed himself. Um, and so Captain Fitzroy wanted a, a gentleman of his own class. And so he, um, he advertised and Darwin got the job. And this was the turning point for Darwin because Darwin went on the Beagle, he suddenly saw Amazonian rainforests, he saw fossils, um, he saw islands, and he noticed all sorts of things which were be beginning to ferment in his mind. He noticed that on islands off the coast of South America, for example the Galapagos Islands, the animals and plants there were obviously related to mainland South American ones, but they were a bit different. And different islands had different forms on them. And this started to bubble away in Darwin's mind. In other parts of South America, he found fossils. He discovered a number of gigantic, extinct fossil creatures. Some of them in museums are actually Darwin's own specimens. He also, a very big influence on him was that he took with him on the Beagle the, the book on geology by Charles Lyell, the great geologist of the time. And Lyell was putting forward the notion, which was quite strange, as you say, Paul, it was, it was not familiar to people in those days, that the earth was extremely old. And Lyell also was advocating the view that in order to understand the way the past is, you study the present, you study the processes that are ever so slowly going on during uh, our own time, erosion, things like that. And you extrapolate back and you explain the way the earth is formed by assuming that over gigantic eras of time, these same forces were going on. So Darwin was prepared by reading Lyell to understand that the earth was very, very ancient, which not that many people did at the time. However, he didn't actually tumble to his theory while, while on the voyage of the Beagle. That, that came later. Well, quite, quite a lot later, really, wasn't it? Because he then he returned to England and sort of vanished, I, I get the impression. He wasn't really heard of again until 1859 with the publication of Origin. What, what took him so long? Yes. It, it's not quite true he wasn't heard of again, but it, it is true that he waited an awful long time uh, before publishing the Origin in, in 1859. He, he was a distinguished scientist. He was elected to the Royal Society. He was a fellow of the Royal, Royal Geographical Society and other learned societies. He was, he was a well-known scientist uh, because of the, um, well, the specimens that he brought back from the Beagle, his, his book about the voyage of the Beagle made him famous. However, it is true that he sat on his theory, he first thought of it, in the, got it really right, I mean got it really complete in his mind, in the early 1840s. And then, so he waited, not quite 20 years, but getting on for 20 years before he, uh, he went public. Um, part of that time he spent, I think it was 11 years, he spent studying the taxonomy of barnacles, highly specialized zoological work. All the time he was sitting on this powder keg of a theory. I find it astonishing that he wasn't afraid of being scooped uh, because mm. It's such a simple idea and such an immensely powerful one that you'd think that he'd have been worried about somebody else 
coming up with it, as indeed they eventually did in 1858, mm -hmm. Al Alfred Russell Wallace did. There's been a little bit of speculation recently about um, which came first, the Wallace or the Darwin, um, whether Darwin perhaps just actually stole Wallace's idea and made off with it. Um, I think you have some quite strong feelings about yes. that, don't you? Yes. There are people who try to champion Wallace oh. to that extent. Um, what happened was Wallace was a younger man. He was an explorer like Darwin in the Far East, where, where Darwin had been an explorer in um, mostly South America. And he, he tumbled to the same idea, but much later than Darwin. He didn't really get it until 1858, which was, ne well, 15 years after Darwin had got it. Um, it is true that when Wallace sent a letter to Darwin outlining his theory, it was this that uh, prompted Darwin into, into action. And so there's a certain amount of justice in people who say that um, while Darwin didn't steal Wallace's idea, it was true that Wallace, having had the idea independently, stimulated Darwin into action. Um, both of them behaved in a very gentlemanly way. Um, Darwin's immediate response was to feel very, very despondent, and he felt that perhaps he ought to withdraw and give Wallace the credit. He was persuaded not to do that by his friends Lyle and Hooker, and Lyle and Hooker, who were very eminent scientists, geologists and botanists respectively, persuaded Darwin to uh, let some papers by Darwin and Wallace's paper that he just, just sent to, to Darwin, to have these read at the Linnaean Society in 1858 simultaneously. Well, not literally simultaneously, one after the other. Um, and so this was a, a, a nice, gentlemanly, civilized way of sharing the credit which was done. Unfortunately, in 1858 at the Linnaean Society, not many people took any notice. And uh, in fact, um, at the end of the year, the president of the Linnaean Society said something like, it has not been one of those years that's marked by <laughs> any uh, revolutionary ideas that one would wish to write home about or something like that. Um, meanwhile, Darwin was working very hard writing The Origin of Species which came out a year later in 1859. It wasn't that difficult for him because all those years, Darwin had been working on what he called his great book, which was to have been called Natural Selection, which would have been a huge book. The Origin of Species, Darwin described as an abstract mm -hmm. of the great book. Uh, and so he got it out very quickly. And then in 1859, all hell broke loose in the Victorian world. It was then that people really cottoned on to what a revolutionary uh, idea this, this really was. Uh, and it was extremely controversial. A lot of people got very upset about it. A lot of other people were very inspired by it. It is an extraordinarily powerful idea. When you think about it, it explains absolutely everything about life, including ourselves. And yet, it's an extraordinarily simple idea. So if you express the power of a theory as a sort of ratio of what it explains divided by what it needs to postulate or assume in order to do the explaining. It must be the most powerful theory in the world because what it explains is everything about life. And yet what the theory is itself, the, the denominator below the line of this equation is, uh, well, natural selection. It's just very, very simple indeed. What I find astonishing is that it took so long for the human race to produce a Darwin.